Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading true stories of deep woods horror. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. So a few months ago, I went out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of Western Maryland, and we were about six miles into an eight mile loop that we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking, and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button-down shirt, not exactly hiking attire. We decide to set off on the last two-mile leg of the loop. This part goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain-slash-bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail, and you have to walk single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her, and I see the same man right behind her, following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut-wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear, and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe, as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us in case he is only following closely because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled, and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he's carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has sight lines to us and he turns around looking up at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy, and we don't want to have to pass him again. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and see him walking up the trail too. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area that we were at before. We start to strategize and wait deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There are more people around here, so we felt safer waiting it out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We're talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or he is waiting on the trail where it's more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between this lot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and says, we need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there. He had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure that we got to our car safely again and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail, but there was no sight of him. I wish I knew where he went and what happened to him, but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. The last time I went hiking alone was in 2016, and I asked my husband to drop me off at the nearest Arboretum on his way to a job, my favorite park. 
Usually, there were a lot of joggers and people with dogs, so it didn't seem like a bad idea to just go in the middle of the day by myself. On that particular day, I think I was almost alone, except for one other guy. I kept running into him, maybe mid-30s, taking pictures. He looked like a park ranger, so at first I didn't find him creepy or unusual. I'm also there taking pictures. I just start making it a point to get away because I didn't want to ruin his photos. At some point I got the feeling like I am the subject of his photos, and that was when I started to get creeped out. I started looking for a way out of the park, and as I made my way out, he was there again. I tried to keep it friendly and say something innocuous related to the job. I don't remember what. And he said, Oh, I don't work here. We said nothing more. We are out of the park and I ran up to my husband's car and loudly said, Hi honey, I missed you. Not deterred by my husband's presence at all, the guy came over before I could even tell my husband about what just happened, and he said, By the way, my name is Jordan. Check out my photos on Facebook. And he handed me a business card. I never did check out his page, but his business card floated around my bag for months, reminding me that I no longer enjoy solo hiking anymore. This is a true story. Every time I tell it, it pulls the eyes of everyone in the room. I'm not sure why I haven't posted it before, but upon reflecting with a friend, I decided it was time to share. In the summer of 2020, my friends, Alex and Violet and I decided to go on a mountain vacation. COVID cabin fever had hit us hard and we were desperate to get out. We settled on a mountain estate and planned to camp and hike at several different locations. For one night, We thought it would be fun to book a cabin in the woods. Violet's parents had rented a fire tower once and loved it, but a cabin beside a fire tower was all we could find. It was cheap, clean, and secluded. Excited to have a night where we could just be as obnoxious as we wanted, we booked it. In the weeks leading up to the trip, we decided it would be a great idea to drop acid at the cabin. Violet brought an entire sheet in preparation for our arrival and it was tucked in her bag as we pulled out of the driveway to make our way to the cabin. I remember this knot in the pit of my stomach, this aching feeling that gnawed at me. I told Alex and Violet that there was no way we could drop acid that night. Violet was pissed. We turned around and got into a massive argument, but I stood my ground. I just knew that we had no business tripping that night. Finally, the fireworks settled and we were off. The cabin was roughly 30 minutes away from the nearest town. It sat atop a mountain. We held our breath as we rounded the busted road that spiraled towards the top. There were no pull-offs, no other campsites, just a long winding road that led us to the cabin at the peak. We settled in and started a fire to keep warm. As dusk gave way to night, we heard the unmistakable noise of an engine on the road, then the flash of headlights. A side-by-side with three kids arrived and our nerves settled. They smiled, gave us a wave, climbed the fire tower, and left. We would heard there may be occasional visits to the fire tower, but they were the only ones who'd come by. We doused the fire and moved inside, heated some hot dogs until they were lukewarm, ate them fast, and sat in the silence. You don't know how quiet it is until you're in the middle of nowhere. You can hear every rustle of the leaves the whisper of the wind through their branches. You get so used to white noise, living in the city. There's always the hum of an air conditioner or the dim roar of traffic to focus on. Here, the closest thing to white noise was the sound of our own breathing. We jumped at every noise, too frightened to speak to one another. And finally, I'd had enough. I cracked a few wine coolers, passed them to Alex and Violet, and slapped the board game down on the table between our bunk beds. It didn't take long for us to loosen, and we were laughing, having the racious good time that we'd envisioned. Much soberer than we'd thought, but enough that we were able to ignore the rumble of the woods. Later, we'd all recall hearing noises in the background. The snap of a twig, the dim rumble of an engine, 
None of us wanted to rupture the air of the nonchalance between us, so we ignored it. Until a human hand reached up the window between us and slapped it three times. We were screaming in an instant. Alex called 911, put them on speakerphone, and handed his cell to me. He grabbed pokers from the fireplace and passed them out. Violet started calling family members and saying her last goodbyes. I held my breath and listened for any more noise. Whoever this was, whatever this was, would have heard us call 911, and now they were being careful to make a silent retreat. Dispatch arrived 20 minutes later, a lucky thing for a 1 a.m. emergency call, and their dogs combed the mountain. Nothing. They suggested it may have been a bear, but I could tell from their faces that they didn't believe that for a second. We'd barely cooked those hot dogs, and why would a bear smack the window by a couple of screaming kids, rather than the one closest to the pan we'd used to cook? Why would a bear knock on the window like a human? Why, when we screamed, did the bear make a stealthy retreat? They had no answers, but they had one anecdote. As they'd sped to us, they'd come across a car at the base of the mountain, but that was the only sign of life they'd seen. I remember my blood ran cold, but Alex and Violet were too frazzled to absorb the weight of what they'd said and dizzied by a new horror. Violet's car, thoroughly dusted by our drive up that mountain, was covered in handprints. Handprints that didn't match ours, that touched places we hadn't. We grabbed our stuff by the armful and threw it inside, eager to remove every part of ourselves from this mountain. We followed the police, grateful every pothole found us further and further from that wretched cabin. We made it down in record time and found lodging at a seedy hotel that reeked of cat pee. I couldn't sleep. The thought of that car on the road rang in my head. Remember, there was nothing else on that mountain. It was a narrow road to the top. No pull-offs, no other campsites. There was the fire tower. Maybe a visitor decided to spook us during their late night excursion. But the kids from earlier, we'd seen their headlights. Whoever did this had stopped their vehicle further down the road and hiked the rest of the way. They didn't want to be spotted. They wanted silence, secrecy. Whoever this was hadn't been looking for a cheap scare. They'd planned this. I don't think I'll ever know what the person on the mountain wanted from me. I don't know if it was a practical joke or the beginning of a night terror. I'm grateful for Alex's quick wit in dialing 911. I wonder if our visitor knew we had service. It had definitely been a welcome surprise to us. Perhaps that was a wrench in his plan. Enough to spook him before he could make things ugly. In truth, I don't know if I want to know. So, to preface... I would like to state that this story is probably going to read like the plot of a campy 1980s horror movie, and it's going to sound very long. However, this entire story is true. If not for being five miles from cell reception and the way the story ends, there will be a police report for verification. I will be changing the names, locations, and some details in order to protect the privacy of the innocent. A buddy of mine and I try to camp twice a month now that I have a vehicle, that can be trusted and get me to some of the more remote areas of our state. We planned a camping trip for this past weekend. We chose a fairly remote location we had been to the previous weekend. The previous weekend, we were the only people we'd seen within a mile of our camp spot. Friday night, we got there and set up. This story takes place Saturday night. It's about 9 p.m., so the sun is long gone and the moon hasn't quite risen yet. It's pitch black out other than what our fire lights up. Suddenly, we hear a man screaming. We listen intently, silently sharing an anxious look. At first, we were hoping it was someone drunk and having a little too much fun, but it quickly becomes obvious that this isn't fun party screaming. It isn't even like he's hurt. 
It sounds full of despair, anger, and anguish. I'm going to take a moment to remind you that this is at 9 p.m., pitch black night, in the middle of nowhere woods, five miles from the nearest cell phone signal. We hadn't seen anyone in hours. The screaming continues for what felt like hours, but was probably about a solid five minutes. We had no idea what to make of it and started feeling extremely paranoid. We gathered up anything remotely close to a weapon and tried to come up with explanations of the screaming while keeping our eyes on the forest around us. After about 15 tense minutes of fear induced paranoia, I nearly fell out of my seat as I watched a flashlight and lantern slowly into our camp. I greeted the stranger with a basic how's it going before he was even lit up by the fire. He responded quickly but flatly by asking if we could do him a favor. That depends on the favor, my buddy and I said in unison, obviously tense, holding our weapons close to us. The stranger proceeded to ask if he could hang out for a second by the fire. Given the two of us and one of him, plus our myriad of weapons gathered from around camp to within our arm's reach, we decided to agree and let him hang out. After a short second of awkward silence, I ask him what the hell is going on. He proceeds to tell me and my buddy that he was camping down by the trail with his buddy and that his buddy had snapped and tried to kill him. Wait, what? I said before the thought even finished processing in my head. Is that the screaming we heard earlier? The man slowly nods, staring blankly into the fire and begins this story. We were just hanging out, man. We came up earlier today and my buddy just freaked out. He started screaming and screaming and just wouldn't stop. Then he attacked me. He lunged at me and I told him to just back off and chill, you know? Well, he kept coming after me and it started getting pretty violent and I'm pretty sure that he was going to kill me so I grabbed my car keys, the lights, and I ran. I don't know what to do, man. He chased me when I ran and I don't know what to do. We don't have firearms or anything, but we do have a hatchet. My buddy and I look at each other for a second, completely astonished. Then something horrible dawned on me. Wait, he chased you? Like he's on his way here? Right now? The man slowly just nods in reply, and right on cue like some terrible horror movie come to life we hear screaming from maybe 30 to 40 feet from our camp down the main trail. I just want your effing balance, Gary. I want your effing balance, Gary. Gary. Where are you? Where? Gary! I'd never in my life heard a man scream like this. I've never heard anything like it in my life. It was a brutal, guttural scream that was shrill to the ears yet deep in pitch. The sound of someone gone completely mad, and the way he said the stranger's name would switch erratically from long and sing-songy to short, guttural punches of sound. We killed our lights, became silent, and listened. By some miracle, the madman didn't notice our camp and continued walking down the trail screaming the whole way. We ended up chatting with who we'll call Gary for hours, listening to the screaming getting further and further. Come to find out, they had taken four and a half to five grams of magic mushrooms each, and his buddy, who we'll call Ty, was a co-worker of his and was fine for three and a half hours, then suddenly snapped. It seemed as though Ty thought that he could kill Gary and steal his good trip. We hear the screams getting further and further for over two hours. By this time it's 11 p.m. The moon is starting to come out and it's below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Ty had no jacket or flashlight according to Gary. My buddy and I are way too drunk to drive out of camp to get cell service. And it was snowy and icy and required two to three miles of highway driving after getting off the trail and Gary was still lightly feeling the effects of weed and mushrooms, so he couldn't drive either. We had to make the decision to let the guy wander, hope he sobered up and could find his way back. And he did. Oh, he did. Right into our camp. We hear yelling after about an hour of no screams, maybe 30 to 50 feet away from camp. Hey, help. Please help me, I'm lost. And we can tell the man's walking from the woods into our camp. We tell Gary to hide just in case and greet the man with me carrying my 12 gauge shotgun and my 40 cal pistol holstered. 
my buddy carrying his AK-47 style rifle and his two 9mm Glocks holstered and with our flashlights on our brightest settings in his face. He was about 6 foot 2 or 6 foot 3 and approximately 300 pounds. We talked to him, decided he was calm enough to walk with, and walked him back to his camp. He seemed really remorseful, said he blacked out and didn't remember anything, and had a falling out with his buddy. We escorted him back to his camp down the trail, returned and told Gary that Ty seemed cool, and if anything else happened to scream and come running, we would come out and help him out. It ended up being a happy ending. We made friends with Gary, and I got his phone number to make sure that the next day he got back into town safely, back to his wife and kid, and we are actually planning a camping trip with him soon. But Ty, who wandered screaming like a deranged maniac into the forest, potentially wielding a hatchet to murder your friend to steal his good trip, or whatever it is your psychosis-filled mind was thinking, for the love of God, let's not meet again. Last year, I was hiking in Shenandoah, Virginia. It was a planned two-day hiking trip, myself and two friends. Late into the first day, one of my friends grew ill and decided to turn back. The second friend joined him, just in case it got worse. They told me to go on, and seeing as I had been looking forward to the trip, I did. As evening approached, I came upon a clearing in the forest. On a table, surrounded by tools and several cans of spray paint, was an elaborate dollhouse. It was large, perhaps three feet tall. Its walls and windows were open, as if it had just been built and was drying. The lingering smell of spray paint still hung in the air around it. On the back of the house, a photo had been affixed. It was a family picture. Old, perhaps taken in the 80s. Everyone in the picture looked very uncomfortable, like they didn't want to be taking the picture or were forced to. Not scared, just very uncomfortable. I left it, and continued on so that I might reach my planned campsite by nightfall. The wind had picked up considerably. In the distance, I heard a branch give and fall, crashing to the forest floor, startling me. I found my campsite, but was a bit unnerved by the dollhouse in the middle of nowhere. I realized I didn't want to camp out in the open where whoever was working on it might stumble upon me. I had one of those little one-person tents that stand just tall enough for a person to lay down in. I set it up behind a thick stand of brush, one side blocked off by a tall stand of rocks. I was glad for this, because not only was I now hidden, but the rocks effectively blocked the heavy winds, which had now turned cold as the frigid air tumbled down from the mountains at night. The sound of the wind-churned forest was relaxing, and I think I fell asleep right away. Have you ever been awoken by a loud sound and you're unsure what it was exactly, but some remnant of it echoes in your mind for a moment after waking? That's what happened to me sometime later, in the pitch dark. I had the sensation that someone was near. I listened intently, trying to hear over the wind. I heard a man's voice somewhere in the distance. Harsh. Rapid. Then becoming softer. He was too far away for me to discern what he was saying, but close enough that I could hear inflection and cadence. It sounded like a crazy person scolding himself. Then, his voice becoming softer, answering. As I listened, his voice grew louder and louder, until I could hear his clumsy footfalls crashing towards me. He walked by where I was camped, just several feet away from the brush that concealed me. By now, my eyes had adapted somewhat to the pale moonlight but I still couldn't make out anything more than a large, massive shape. He was probably about six foot six, heavily built. He was carrying something long beneath his arm, a rolled up tent, I guessed. He was angrily talking about someone's face and how it haunted him. His voice then became childlike, and his conversation with himself turned to the topic of cheese and crackers. The dude was clearly off his rocker. That 
or high on something really good. After a moment, he continued on, his voice receding until I could no longer hear him. I slept very little that night afterward. At first light, I booked it the way back I came, back to town. I noted that the dollhouse was not in the clearing when I passed back by. Whoever that stranger in the night was, I'm glad we did not meet. Years ago, man, I am old, but let's say in the mid-1990s, I worked as a woodland firefighter while in the Army Reserves. I worked as a spotter. Basically, I was stationed in a giant fire tower in the middle of a national park. My job was as it sounds. I would use binoculars and look out for fire, smoke, or other telltale signs of fire. My nearest compadre was five miles or so from me. My days consisted of working my shift, taking long walks around the fire tower, being on lookout for anyone who might be having illegal fires, looking out for wildlife, and staying afoot of bears and wolves. The way our shifts worked back then was one week on, one week off. So we slept in the towers, cooked our own food, etc. There were nearby toilets and showers for our use. One day, I came across an illegal bear trap. I had several ranger friends and I safely set off the trap, then picked it up to take to the ranger station on one of my treks out for food in my jeep. Poaching is illegal in the park, and carried a big fine even back then, and some jail time, but it did not stop the poachers from trying. I heard rifle shots and headed back for my fire tower. We did have a rifle in the tower, to be used in case of emergencies. Just a few months back, a fellow spotter had been mauled to death by a grizzly bear, so each tower had been outfitted with a rifle. I looked with my binoculars, but did not see anything out of the ordinary. I radioed my co-worker, Ben, an older guy in the adjacent tower. He hadn't heard anything today, but had come across a few traps himself. That night, after a dinner of frank and beans and toast, I was writing to my future wife, and I heard the rumbling of a truck. Thinking it may be Ben, occasionally he'd make the trek over, we would crack open a soda and chat for a bit. Instead, I saw four men with rifles get out of the truck. One looked around and leaned up against the truck while the other three grabbed traps and began to set them up. I grabbed the rifle and my lantern and headed down the stairs. I was only 21, a farmer's son from rural Virginia farming town, and even with one deployment behind me, I was naive. I should have called it into the rangers, but instead I thought I could talk some sense into four dangerous men. I barely got a, hey, what are you doing out of my mouth before I was roughly shoved by rough hands. My lantern fell and I heard it crack. The rifle was kicked away from me and I felt the breath leave my chest when I was violently kicked in the stomach. I barely had caught my breath when I was grabbed by two of the men and was shoved forward into the woods. It seemed like we walked for miles, but in reality it was probably only a mile. However, I noticed that there were no sounds. In the forest, it's rarely silent. It's a cacophony of sounds, even at night. Owls, wolves, crickets. But on this night, nothing. Suddenly, I was shoved onto my knees and I felt hot tears well up. I thought of my parents, my little sister and brother, and my fiancé who were back home in Virginia. I heard the rack of a gun, and I shut my eyes and prayed. Suddenly, the night erupted. However, it was the sounds of sirens, those of forest rangers, and behind them in his pickup, Ben, who had tried to radio me that he had heard a car's engine and came to my tower when I didn't reply. The poachers were arrested. Ben drove me back to the tower. I was still shaking. He didn't lay into me for not following procedure. Just said, that was close, kid. I ended up leaving the job months later to take a job closer to home but I never ran into any more poachers during the rest of my time. I kept in contact with Ben for a while, sent him a wedding invite and then a photo of my firstborn son in 1997. However, as time usually does, we lost track of one another. 
and a few years back I googled him. He would have been 75 or so, just to discover that he passed away a few years back. I don't know whatever came of those poachers, but I hope that they rot in prison. So I live in the Pacific Northwest, which has a great number of excellent campsites. A favorite of mine isn't actually a designated campsite, but a forest road on a river. Being a moody young woman, I would frequently make sojourns in my dumpy Toyota Camry to this one spot so I could be alone on the river and meditate on whatever was bothering me. Camping alone as a 20-something female offered inspired anxiety in both myself and my folks, but I didn't let that deter me. Camping alone was something that I genuinely enjoyed doing, and after experiencing a series of emotional misfortunes, I needed the time to myself. The last time I ever went to this particular spot, I must have been around 21. I had just had a closure conversation with someone who broke my heart some months prior, and wanted to take some time to process that. Luckily enough, I had gotten consecutive days off from my retail job, so I packed up my car and made the three-hour drive to the spot. This spot is fairly well known, and often a few other campers would be there on weekends, but during the week it would be more than likely empty. By the time I had arrived, it was late afternoon, and I was slightly disappointed to discover a turquoise Chevrolet truck and another silver car parked closest to the river. I parked some distance behind them and began unloading my things. Two young gentlemen were hanging out by the truck, and as I passed by they greeted me. I muttered a hello and kept walking. I picked a spot that I thought was nice and went back to get the rest of my things. As I was passing their cars again, one of the men, the shorter, stockier one, rushed to a boulder near the path where some pistols, I later learned they were air pistols, were setting and quickly concealed them saying, oh, sorry about that, I didn't mean to scare you. There was something childlike in his manner, like he did this specifically so that I would pay attention to him. I told him it was fine. I wasn't scared and kept walking. I unloaded the rest of my things, set up my camp and got a fire going. I was kind of tired after the long day of driving and hauling my stuff around. So I plopped down in a camp chair and got some chili mac cooking for dinner. It was a beautiful evening. Not too hot and golden hour on the river is always a fantastic thing. So I was thoroughly enjoying the moment. I could see the two men swimming up the river a bit but it was easy enough to ignore them. By the time I finished eating, they passed by my camp on the opposite bank and were walking in the woods. I went down to the bank to get water for my dishes and heard the stockier one call out to me. Hey, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a good guy, okay? Maybe this should have alarmed me more, but it didn't. I definitely thought the guy was socially inept, but left my judgments at that and elected to answer with a polite okay. I wanted him to leave me alone and thought that if I was nice but uninterested, he'd take the hint. This was a demonstrably ineffective approach. Some time had passed, and I had been musing over the last week's events and just general enjoying the beauty around me when he came limping up to my camp. He was doing a feigned grunt as if he was in pain. I don't exactly remember the exchange we had, but he wound up setting at my camp and explaining to me that he had had some injuries in the past that were adversely impacted by the cold of the river. Before I go any further, I'll preface this by saying that I was pretty passive as a younger person, especially with strangers. I've definitely had to practice setting and maintaining boundaries as I've gotten older, and this instance demonstrates the danger of failing to do so. I kick myself every time I tell this story. I'm not sure if immediately telling the guy to piss off would have made him leave me alone, being a young pretty girl alone in the woods, but I regret not speaking my mind more clearly that day. All that said, given some previous experiences, I had taken on a policy of engaging in active listening with others who seemed to be struggling. I obviously was faced with my own woes and wanted to be treated compassionately, so I aimed to do the same with others. It was clear that this guy was having issues, and by all exterior judgments, seemed like he was down on his luck, even with some maladaptive tendencies. 
He continued to stay at my camp and began telling me all about his life. These stories were pretty fantastical. The kind of lies a child would tell you of some incredible adventure or grandeur. As they went on, they went into weirder and weirder territory. He explained that the aforementioned injuries that were paining him were the result of falling a great distance while on a welding job, where his hand was caught by being impaled by a piece of rebar. He described his heroic effort of self-preservation by unhooking himself from the rebar and falling the rest of the distance, breaking his legs or something like that. I just gave him a series of, yeah, uh-huh, and oh wow, that must have been painful. He revealed that he was recently homeless after splitting up with his girlfriend, who had been talking to another guy. That's why he was staying here in his truck, the aforementioned Chevy. He also told me that he DJed at a joint in the closest town and made a lot of money doing it. He increased his exaggerations by telling me that he was also a five-star chef and enlightened me on a gross-sounding dish of his own creation that was essentially a soup made from watered-down fruit jelly and some other sweet things. He also told me that he had once been a Navy SEAL, specializing in small arms. It was then he revealed to me that the pistols he thought scared me before were air pistols, and he augmented his tale of being in special forces by demonstrating some twirls with one of them and showing me what ultimately turned out to be some mediocre marksmanship. At a later point, he wound up giving me one of them, because it made him think of doing bad things. I hesitantly accepted it. I was pretty sketched out by this point and wanted the dude to leave, but lacked the backbone to tell him to go away. Unfortunately, as the evening wore on, he just continued to get weirder and weirder. By this point, he began bringing his belongings from his truck and setting them around my camp. This was a process that happened gradually, each new conversation note eliciting a new show and tell idea. I can't remember all he brought down, but it included his guitar and a lot of other stuff. He tried to give me some of it, but... After the air pistol, I declined. The conversation dragged on, eventually with him telling me in detail about some childhood traumas. His father, who had been in the military, was very strict and often beat him. He also told me about his cousin, who had S-aid him severe enough to leave scars in certain areas, which he described to me in very, very much detail. He got really close to me when he told me this, looking me square in the eye, unblinking. And that's why I'd never hurt you, he said, still staring at me. I kid you not, my skin started to crawl. I had a few things to defend myself with, a hunting knife and some bear spray. But he hadn't done anything directly threatening yet. Not long after this, his ex-girlfriend showed up. He introduced me as his friend, and they talked a little bit before he kind of ignored her in favor of me. The whole thing made me even more uncomfortable. She didn't stay long and sped away in her truck. I'm assuming in some fit of jealousy. What did I do to deserve that? I didn't say anything other than I was going to bed, hoping he'd take the hint and leave. He said he needed some alone time, himself, and I thought that I had lucked out. I went into my tent to bed down for the night as it had just gotten dark, only to discover that a cheap ring had been left on my pillow. He must have placed it there when I stepped away to go to the bathroom or something. Furthermore, I could hear him still wandering around my campsite. I peeked out of my tent, and he had his head in his hands as he paced and was muttering to himself. A powerful feeling of needing to flee came over me. There was no way I could stay there. Even if he didn't do anything to hurt me, he, at minimum, would annoy me the whole three days that I planned to stay. I immediately started to pack my stuff. And when he asked what I was doing, I told him I was just going to go. Since I was car camping, I had a bit of stuff with me that would require a few trips, and I hurried to get it all in my car. On one trip up the path to the parking area, he stood in the middle of the path, complaining that my flashlight was blinding him. I didn't say anything. I was able to complete most of my trips after that unbothered, though I went with one arm free so that I could carry my hunting knife and be ready in case he tried to get physical with me. On my second to last trip down, he came out of the dark from the direction of his truck. He was sobbing and cried, but I didn't do anything wrong. I flat out ignored him and ventured down the path once more to grab what I could and hightail it to my car. I wound up leaving a cord of wood behind, not seeing it worth the danger to go back for it. 
I shut all my doors and hopped in, absolutely elated at the sound of my 30-year-old car starting right up. I got the hell out of there and drove the three hours back to my house. I didn't have reception until about halfway through the drive, during which point I called my mom and told her what happened. She was upset that I didn't tell her where I was going. I told my dad and stepmom, whom I lived with at the time, and that she was glad I was okay. When I got back, my stepmother asked me what I was doing back, and I explained what happened all over again. My dad later suggested I get a gun if I wanted to continue solo camping in case something like that happened again. The next day, I went out to my car so that I could drive to meet some friends and found my tire had gone flat. What an immense stroke of luck it was that it didn't happen at that campsite or somewhere else in the mountains where I didn't have reception. I'm in my mid-twenties now and moved to the city about six months ago. My roommate and best friend discovered the air pistol while he was helping me move. He knew I didn't own any guns and was immensely confused, thinking it was real. When he asked me about it, I laughed and explained what happened. I haven't been back to that site since, and while I'd definitely bring a friend there, I probably will never go alone again. I'm a late 20s female, and this happened fairly recently. Nothing bad happened to me, but I'm lucky it didn't, and it easily could have. There's a conservation area that I used to like to walk in regularly. It's beside a golf course near an ordinary subdivision just off a busy road, and it's popular with dog walkers and photographers. The conservation area is fairly well maintained, and alerts its users that there are hidden cameras everywhere. My point in bringing attention to all of this is to say that by all accounts that it's very safe. Vanilla. Urban. Wooded area. In a populated area. One big thing about me is that I like isolation to recharge. I dislike crowded trails. And by convention, go in off peak hours. Or when the weather is unpleasant. Not dangerous, but unpleasant. Too cold. Lightly raining. Foggy, etc. I stay safe, but I like there to be as few people around as possible. In a city, in daylight, I don't feel like I'm taking any risks by doing this. First encounter. There was one day I went at around 4 p.m. or so on a frigid, rainy Monday in November. On days like that, there are maybe only one or two dog walkers. But today, there was no car in the parking lot, except for a dirty blue pickup truck with a man sitting in it. I noticed that he was looking at me, but that didn't really bother me. I was just happy to see the trail was empty. On this particular day, I went to the area to practice my navigation skills. I was learning how to use a compass at that time, and it's good to practice that skill in an area that you won't get lost in. So I decided to go off trail to a big pine plantation, which is a big open area with large mature pine trees, if you're not familiar. It's not a hiking area, or really that interesting in any way and definitely off trail. You wouldn't get there unless you really wanted to get there. So I pick my first landmark and sight it using my compass, and I'm pacing towards it. I find myself about halfway there when I hear rustling through the bushes, and I turn around to see the man from the dirty blue pickup truck there, entering the pine plantation. Mid-50s white man, a little pudgy, wearing a baggy beige cardigan and blue slacks. I feel pretty alert at this point, feels out of place somehow. I take note, but pretend to keep walking around with my compass because I don't want to seem weird. I look at him. He pretends to ignore me. I'm getting a really bad gut feeling about the situation for some reason at this point, and it feels like he's following me. But I have an anxiety disorder, so I try not to freak out for zero reason, and I don't want to ruin my relaxation time. It's just a guy walking around. No big deal. To see if he's following me, I pivot 180 degrees and walk directly towards the trail again. He's still following me. I walk through the bushes onto the trail, still following me. At this point, I was freaked out. The pine plantation entrance is only about 50 feet onto the trail, 
So this guy would have had to have walked 50 feet, entered the pine plantation, then decided that that was it for the day? Bad odds. Definitely following me. I quickly exited the trail, and when I'm leaving the parking lot, I see that he's still looking at me. I take the long way home. The experience freaks me out, and I only visit the area once before the second encounter. This time was in January. This time I want to go bird watching. A week prior, I had seen an owl in the same pine plantation. I was practicing navigation again, and I wanted to see it again. I had seen it about an hour before sundown, so I figured that that was a good time to try to see it again in the same area. I checked the parking lot, and there was no blue pickup truck, but there were two other cars with men. One was a red sedan with heavily tinted windows, and it looked like the other one was empty. So I go on the trail again. Today is muddy, wet, and cold. Area should be totally empty. Good. Unfortunately, not so. About 20 feet onto the trail, I hear footsteps behind me. I don't like when people walk behind me, but it's not a crime and I'll lose them soon when I go to the pine plantation. I'm sure you know where this is going. When I walk on the pine plantation, there is the same rustling of the bushes before, and when I turn around, I see the same man from before. I feel a wave of terror and dread come over me, alone in a muddy forest with a possible stalker, but it's still so calm and feels so mundane. To confirm my fears, I walk over to the area where I saw the owl last week and pause to look for it. Who do I see next to me is the same freaking guy from before. I am terrified at this point, and every part of me is screaming run. So I walk as fast as I can to the trail again. I pass some other random guy in the same plantation and smile at him, just totally on autopilot. He smiles back. It wasn't until I was in the parking lot where I got freaked out that there was a second person in the same pine plantation. Could they have been connected somehow? I stop briefly in the parking lot and take out a small notepad to quickly write down the license plates of the two cars. This gives the original man time to catch up to the parking lot. I am booking it out, on foot, of the parking lot, and he yells towards me. Can I give you a ride? And I just shake my head and keep walking. As I walk away, he begins to follow me in his car. He waits at the intersection to see which direction I'm going in, and I decide to walk in a busy park to lose him. He pulls into a nearby hidden driveway and stares at me, and takes out his phone to presumably take a photo of me. He notes what direction I'm walking in, and then does a U-turn and drives fast the other way. Conclusion I took the long way home, filled out a police report, and the police opened an investigation on it. I have not gone back to the conservation area since, and the experience has definitely left me with an ongoing nervousness about being alone. Doubly more, because I do not know who the second guy is. I passed him so quickly, I only know that he was in his mid-fifties and had glasses and was bald. The police unfortunately told me that there's nothing they can really do at this point, so the best I can do is stay vigilant and try to not let it freak me out too much. Unfortunately, this has totally ruined my love for going out into the wilderness alone. Nothing bad happened, but I think that was more because I was able to escape and lose them before anything did. Hey folks, I'm kind of new and this is the first story that I've ever submitted here, so let's get started. I must clarify that this didn't happen only to me, but my uncle too. This was after a Christmas Eve party, when everyone went home. I decided to stay because my cousin and I were watching a movie. My uncle, who used to walk his dogs into the woods next to a park, went off to take them out. Before this, my aunt told him not to do that, because it was too dark out there. It was around 4 or 5 a.m. He didn't care much and went off anyway. My aunt was still worried, so I went along with him. Once there, anything wrong seemed to happen. Everything was quiet. My uncle and his dogs were having a relaxing walk, as usual, and I wasn't really paying attention to the surroundings when suddenly 
The dogs went still. This wasn't that strange. They always stopped to stare and bark at other animals that they noticed, like rats, birds, insects, or other dogs. However, this time it was different. When the dogs got still, my uncle and I noticed something was going wrong. The dogs weren't angry or curious. They were kind of nervous, anxious, afraid. One of the dogs, the largest one, was growling and shaking. As my uncle started to get worried about that situation, we heard it. People in the woods. We didn't see how many because of the darkness, but they were saying something. We all gather here by the blood of incomprehensible. We incomprehensible. Thee and thy incomprehensible. As my uncle and I heard that, he yelled for his dogs to follow him out of the woods. As we all left, he turned his head back, and he only saw a slight movement of branches and shrubs, perhaps because these people were trying to hide. After all that happened, he hasn't walked his dogs near those woods, nor, when it gets dark, neither. So it was a beautiful Friday. I was still somewhat fresh into my relationship with the love of my life. I had, a week earlier, decided to finally quit the nasty drugs in my life, and had made it one whole week without using. How did my addict mind know how to celebrate? Get a bag of heroin, of course. We were spending the day hiking through the beautiful wooded areas. What I didn't predict was how far down my tolerance had gone. I was getting progressively naughty, but wrote it off to my girl as being sick. As the night began to wind down, we decided to get a fire going on this very remote hilltop way out in the sticks to watch the stars. While we're chilling there, we notice a truck pull up, and while we were a little curious, it wasn't like it's private land or anything. We continued talking and cuddling up next to our fire, thinking maybe just some kids getting high or whatever. Next thing I know, I see this man appear out of the dark on the path. He's walking along, looking like maybe he's going to a lookout area to watch the stars. As he passes, I greet him with a, hey, how's it going? The guy literally just stares at us without saying a word in return and walks past. The look on his face was borderline evil. No expression. Very odd, but I'm a tough guy, so screw it. He walks past a bit later. It's a one-way in-and-out deal, and gets into his truck to drive off. Or so we thought. Now remember, I'm faded, and the nod's getting me bad at this point. I'm going in and out of some dream world, and was speaking out loud what I was experiencing in said dream world. A.K.A. Very high. My girl starts to hear something rustling around in the trees, and tries to alert me, but I'm too faded at first to get what she's saying. But eventually, she gets my attention, and as soon as I heard it too, my adrenaline made me go from dopey to high alert. I grew up in the woods. I know how animals act and how they move. This clearly wasn't an animal. It was making too much noise, and when I tried to yell to scare it off, it would stop moving for a second. It felt like it was getting closer and closer, to the point where I grabbed a big log and began screaming at the woods, come on out. I know you're in there. As I said that, whoever ran wildly crashing through the branches as they went. We decided at this point that it's best to get the F out of there, packed up and walked out log in hand for protection. What we saw as we went out still freaks me out. We saw that guy's same truck pulled down the road a ways into some trees. That creepy man tried to hide his truck to come stalk us, and he was still out there. Needless to say, I was beyond freaked at this point. We ran our butts out of there, and didn't feel safe till we got home. I really hope he was just thinking he'd get a peek of some potential action. But with how far out we were, anything could have happened. This was a major wake-up call for me. I was incapacitated, and unable to protect, to the fullest, the love of my life. 
From there out, I had a few relapses, but that was the beginning of the end. For reference, I haven't touched dope in over a decade. Hey guys, brand new to this thread, and most of Reddit. I just posted a photo on Instagram with this story as my caption, and my friend told me to immediately post it here. It happened to me and my girlfriend on a hike a couple of weeks ago in Washington. We shot this picture a couple of weeks ago just before one of the scariest nights of our lives. Me and my girlfriend hiked a little over 3.5 miles in the dark from this lookout completely alone. She had a bad feeling about it from the beginning and she really didn't want to hike down after sunset. About halfway down, in a portion of the trail so dense with trees the moonlight couldn't even find its way through, we saw a light up ahead on the trail. As soon as we shined our lights in their direction, they immediately turned their lights off. As we approached from about 50 yards away, we started to get a bad feeling, knowing someone was on this trail in the dark. Once we were within about 15 feet of where the light came from, We couldn't find the person who shined it. Instead, we saw a lone camper backpack sitting upright on the ground, just to the side of the trail. Already on red alert at this point, we began scanning the trees with our lights and asking aloud where the person was, knowing there was someone hiding nearby. As we sidestepped slowly down the trail, we saw him, a tall but small-bodied man, hunched over with the backpack on his back. His small stature was hidden behind the size of his backpack, and he was perfectly still in pitch black darkness. When we shined our lights on him, just feet away and seconds from freaking out, I asked, how you doing man? Praying to God that this guy was normal. No response or even a glance in our direction. The guy looked very angry. As he remained perfectly still, my girlfriend shined her light on the ground next to him to reveal a massive axe. And before you ask, no, it wasn't even close to a climbing axe. It was over three feet long and looked as if he had taped a spike onto the opposite end of the blade. When he saw us looking at it, he glanced up at me and slowly picked it up, stood up from the ground and began moving towards us. My girlfriend and I sprinted as fast as we could down the mountain and for the next 30 minutes we moved through the darkness in complete terror. We made it to our car, drove 45 minutes until we could get service, and reported it to 911. I posted this on another thread back in August, but figured I'd share it again. Of the countless hours I've spent in the woods, it's the one time, the only few seconds that I cannot explain. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under our canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lakeshore, ridge, bottoms, bogs, and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important you understand that I've heard, seen, and smelt about all this region has to offer in the way of the wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack and I froze solid. 
This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in springtime means I'm the only one making noise. No birds chirping. Nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around, and I'm going back the way that I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant get out of here. To describe it as best as I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against the smallest tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack and not a thud or a thump, and I have described it as explosive in the past because it was so sudden and so terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come to a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant as soon as I got the courage to move towards the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. In my head, I'm thinking it's somewhere between meth fiend murderer and Bigfoot bludgeoning. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep up the 180 degree turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. It didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point trying to be quiet, taking tiny, shallow breaths so I can listen while humping it up the trail. And then I smell it. A stench hits me that I cannot describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking fast. By the time I made it to the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in our woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many, many times. I don't know. I was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves in trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. First thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood whimpering quietly. I put my bag down grabbed my kit and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a forearmed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked like to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag someone down. They took off, and I waited for their assistance to arrive. It was about an hour until rescue arrived, and I led them to that still unidentified individual. He was not very conversive when I helped him out. 
I was sure he would be dead before we arrived, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue in bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the other person that we helped out. I got home three days later and there was a message on my machine. The story was that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but put it almost directly over his tent and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent and its occupant in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. Dude survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods ever again. I was walking in a section of the Appalachian Trail with a couple of my buddies when we happened across a bundle of sticks. The sticks were made into a figure, kind of similar to the ones from the Blair Witch Project. It was obviously placed there by someone, as it was dead center on the middle of the trail, leaning against a rock. I thought it was cool, so I grabbed it and I put it in my backpack. Anyway, we finished the hike and set up for the night in our camping spot. We were all pretty wiped out from the long day. So after dinner, we retired to our respective tents and conked out for the night. The next morning, I was the first one awake, so I got up to make coffee, and what did I find? An identical bundle of sticks to the one we'd found, sitting atop the pile of charred wood from the previous night's fire. First thing I did was check my pack, and sure enough, the one that I'd picked up was still there. Each of my friends swore they didn't put it there, and I obviously said the same. It was weird because we were all adamant about not putting it there, but I can never be sure one of them wasn't just messing with the other two of us. The thing that messes with me the most is the bundle I found in the morning was almost an exact replica of the one we found on the trail earlier, and I find it hard to believe one of the other guys could have made such a close replica without being able to model it after the one in my pack, and it's not like either would have placed the one on the trail beforehand or for us to stumble upon, as it was far out in the middle of nowhere. I want to believe one of them pulled a prank on the other two because the alternative scares the ever-loving daylights out of me. Years ago, when I was still a teenager, my friend Justin and I would often go longboarding at night, as my friends and I were quite the night owls. We loved the freedom of almost never seeing another soul on the roads or paths that we frequented. Even when using main roads, it would be very rare to see a car out that late in such a rural area, and you could see and hear them coming from very far away due to their headlights and the noise of the vehicle disrupting the peace of the silence at night. We were really into it at the time, and would often ride our boards for miles and miles, sometimes not arriving home until the sun was up. One particular night, we decided to ride a few miles away from our usual back roads to take one of our favorite hidden routes. It began with a narrow, paved path that was the only piece of land separating two sides of a long lake. It would often sink under due to rain, and we wanted to seize the opportunity to use it before it rained and went underwater again. It was roughly two miles long and was extremely relaxing to ride through due to the scenery. After making it to the end of the lake, we decided to continue moving and turn into a very close path that leads directly into a densely wooded wilderness preservation. As we came up to the first hill, we looked down at the bottom into the blackness. We both noticed what appeared to be a tiny moving ball of dim light down there. It moved so strangely and it was extremely difficult to make out what it was. Rather than shine our flashlight down, we curiously watched it for a few moments, whispering to each other about what it could possibly be. 
All at once, that small light turned into multiple blinding lights and extremely loud revving sounds, overwhelming our senses that had become so accustomed to the dark and silence. Acting purely on fear, we instantly turned around and ran as fast as we could, hearing yelling and revving gaining behind us. By sheer luck, we managed to run off path into a very dark, very overgrown hole in the side of a hill, overlooking where we had just come from. We decided to hide in the natural dugout of this hill, hoping the plants and darkness would be enough to protect us from whatever was happening down there. We watched our pursuers ride up to where we had originally been standing. There were four men, two on four-wheelers and two on full-size motorcycles. They were yelling at each other about something, but we couldn't make out what they were saying due to the distance that we had covered. We felt safe enough to whisper very softly to each other and speculated who these people could be. Our first thought was that they might be park rangers of some kind, although we had never seen one here in the many times that we had been, though. And honestly, we doubted that this county even had the budget or even the desire to have anyone patrol the deep woods at night. Besides that, these men were on vehicles entirely inappropriate for the paved bike trails, and they were very angry about something. They called out to us for a while, yelling things like, We know you're out there, and we can see you. Come on out. We stayed silent and decided to call their bluff instead of running. Eventually, we clearly heard one man yell, find them, now, and smash a bottle. That had erased any hope that we had that these were just park rangers. We watched them split up, each of them going a different way down the series of paths on their vehicles, including the path we came from. It took us what felt like ages to even move. We were frozen in terror inside that dugout, watching the lights from the vehicles travel through the woods and paths, one of them already coming full circle and passing the point he started from. I thought about calling for help, but I was too afraid to open my phone and fear that even the smallest amount of light would give away our location. After waiting for the light of the vehicles to reach their farthest distance yet, we finally summoned the nerve to get up and try to run somewhere far enough from these people to safely make a call. We ran as hard and as fast as we could through the woods, since their headlights gave away their location on these paths. We would hide again whenever we felt like they were getting too close. Our available hiding spots were getting progressively worse as the woods became less dense. And the fear that I felt, waiting for one of them to drive past us while basically only being covered in leaves and plants, may still be unmatched to this day. Finally, we emerged from the woods onto the intersection of two main roads, far from where we had started. We ducked down into the ditch to call for help. When I opened my phone, I noticed I had recent missed calls from one of our other friends, Connor, who we were supposed to meet up with after our longboard excursion. I called him and frantically asked where he was. Luck was with us again. He hadn't given up on our plans despite us ignoring him and was only a few miles away, already heading in our direction. I gave him the names of the two streets where we were near the corner of and explained that we needed picked up right away. He agreed to speed over to us while Justin and I waited in hiding. Thankfully, Connor arrived before any of those men did. We bolted into the back seats of his car, yelling for him to get out of there, and he took off. Relief doesn't begin to describe what I felt being safely driven home after everything I had just experienced. After explaining everything that happened to Connor, we ended up just moving on with our night and decided not to call the police. We figured they would be gone by the time any officer made it out there and that we would only be putting ourselves at risk by admitting to breaking the law by taking those paths so late at night. I still have no idea what happened or who those people were. I've been told all kinds of theories from friends and family that have heard this story. Some think we walked right up to a huge drug deal. Justin and I later admitted to each other that when the revving started and we couldn't see, our minds both went to the chainsaw-wielding horror movie serial killer. So I suppose it could have been much worse. Frustratingly enough, whatever those men thought we saw that made them want to catch us so badly, we never actually saw it. Well, I guess we'll never really know, I suppose.
I am a female, and I was 14-ish years old, and a close family friend who went to college nearby was staying with us for winter break. She still had an assignment to turn in for her photography class, so we decided to take some snowy nature pictures of my parents' woods. Our property is out in the country and is five acres, shaped like a skinny line, of woods with a trail through it. But the trail is difficult to access from our backyard because of a very steep 30-foot drop into a stream right behind the house. The house is at one end of the property, and you have to walk all five acres up by the road and around the thick woods just across the stream and get to the trailhead on the other end of the property. Poorly designed, I know. So we're in the thick of the woods near my house, and I'm just waiting for her to finish when I notice movement behind a tree nearby. It's the dead of winter, so anything that isn't a bare tree, mud, or snow really catches your eye. And what I saw was a bright blue jacket poking out. About ten feet behind, blue guy, I see either a youth or a very short man standing and staring at us. We can't see their faces well because the guys are bundled up to the max with hats and scarves. But Blue Dude was definitely a grown man. I get my friend's attention, and we call out the classic horror movie Hello. Unsurprisingly, we receive no reply. We're both already paranoid people, so we looked at each other and silently agreed to get out of there. We start walking away, and Blue Bud and Co. abandon their hidey trees to follow us. We don't have cell reception out there, of course, and it's dumb because geography were very close to my house, but between the thickness of the underbrush, low trees, and the cliff into the freezing water, our only option was to walk the five acres of path in the opposite direction of my house to then reach the road and walk another five acres back. Realizing that we actually are being followed, we started to run. Surprise, the blue jacket man and the short guy run after us. I have asthma that's exacerbated by both exercise and anxiety. Feeling certain that we would be murdered and our families would never know what happened to us, I started having either a panic attack or an asthma attack or both. I kept looking back to see how much distance was closing in between us. We had a head start, but they were undoubtedly faster, getting within maybe 30 or 40 feet of us. Eventually, I looked back and noticed that the little guy disappeared, which makes me panic even more. It's like when you see a spider on your bed and lose it. You know it's still there, but you don't know where. I was terrified that he knew of a trail or something that would allow him to cut through the thick of the woods and pop out at us as we circled back to the house. If you've ever had a dream where you're terrified but you can't scream or move, that's what it felt like. My legs felt like lead, especially running in the snow with snow boots and a snowsuit. My airway closing up. I honestly don't know how I made it to the road, but I did. Once there, we paused to look back and see that Blue Jacket Man had stopped as soon as he reached the clearing. I can only imagine this was because now there were possible witnesses around. We felt much safer, but still ran home, and I obsessively checked to make sure that we weren't being followed. Once home, we frantically told my parents, who brushed it off and definitely thought that we were overreacting. So nothing ever became of it aside from my friend and I feeling crazy, and me being terrified of my own backyard from then on. About nine years later, any time that I'm at the house, I still check to make sure there isn't a blue jacket sticking out from behind a tree in the backyard. To me, their complete silence made it even scarier, because if they had good intentions, why would they not even say anything like, hey wait, it's your neighbor, I need to tell you something. Even with bad intentions, why wouldn't they try to convince us that we were safe? Did they not want to risk anyone hearing them yell? Let me know your theories. But I knew in my gut that they did not have good intentions as soon as I saw them trying to sneak up on us. Over the years I've been on Reddit, I've shared a handful of stories to this sub. This is one that I have been saving for whatever reason, and I think I am ready to share. This is probably my last post here, 
since it's not very often that something happens that is worthy for a post on this sub. Definitely not a bad thing. I've shared my other few experiences, and I think I've saved the best for last. Everything mentioned here is 100% factual. Long read, but I believe it's worth it. I grew up in the South. Tons and tons of beautiful places to see that haven't been taken over by concrete yet. It's nice, but along with that, it's pretty boring. Being a teenager and wanting to go out and have fun led to mostly improvising with your buddies and hoping something good will come out of the night. There wasn't really a local spot to go hang out like a club or a cool bar, and the places that were close to this was boring, because you did them so many times. I'm sure if you've ever lived in a rural area, you can understand that feeling completely. Something that I found a ton of enjoyment in as a teen was just cruising around super late at night listening to music. I would fill my gas tank up, grab something to drink, a cigarillo, and I would just take off driving around until the sun came up. It was a way for me to just clear my mind and relax. Those country back roads were always fun to drive down at 2 a.m., and was also just the right amount of spooky. Well, one night, I absolutely got more than I was to bargain for. I can't remember what month it was exactly, but I know for a fact that it was in the summertime, because I was out of school, and I also remember it being comfortable, chill night. So if I was to guess, it must have been around July or August. I was cruising around like I always did, and was completely worry-free, I had music blaring and I was in my zone. I decided to head down to a park just out of boredom. This particular park is at the very end of a long stretch of desolate country road, but it's a really pretty drive because of that. When I say desolate country road, I don't mean that it's some dirt road that goes through the woods or anything crazy like that. It's a normal paved road, but there's really nothing on it after a certain point. The entire road takes about 20 minutes to drive down to get to the park, and after about 10 minutes into the drive, the houses start to get spread out further and further, to becoming no houses and just road leading into the park. I think a lot of the reason I like this drive at night is because of how creepy it was, and I looked at it as some sort of adventure or whatever. The park isn't open for camping or anything, it's mostly just a lot of land with walking trails and biking trails set up through miles of woods. So obviously, at around 3 a.m. in the morning, it's pretty dead. I made it there and just did a slow, normal little loop around the drive of the park. The night before, it stormed very badly. So badly, I remember my parents and I had to take shelter because of the threat of a tornado touchdown. There ended up being no tornado, but the storms were pretty damn rough. Because of this, I came upon a fallen tree in the road that looped around to the exit of the park. That must have happened because of the storm. It wasn't some massive tree or anything, but I know for a fact that there was no way I could have gotten over it in my car, obviously. It was pitch black everywhere besides the front of my car because of my headlights. And because of that, I immediately ruled out backing up the entire way I just drove when I entered the park. I knew that was super dangerous and there was no way. At this spot on the road, there was flat land on each side of me. I figured that it would make the most sense to just back up into the grass beside me just a little and then drive back the way I came. It was a one-way loop around the park, but I wasn't really worried about going out the wrong way since it was so late. So I started to back up off the road so I could get my car turned around. All was good until I went to pull back onto the road. I totally didn't take into account how wet the grass was and the amount of mud. My car went absolutely nowhere. My back tires were completely stuck and were spinning in place as I was trying to floor the gas pedal. I started to become pretty scared at this point. Not the most ideal situation to be in. I immediately take my cell phone out of my pocket and saw that I had service. Super huge feeling of relief. I called my parents and told them what happened and where I was. They were pretty pissed at me, but said they will pay for a towing truck to come get me out. My parents both drove small four-door sedans, and they would have been zero help in the situation. I was about 45 minutes away from my house, and the rest of most human civilization, so I realized that I would be stuck out there for at least an hour before someone was able to come get me. Freaky feeling, 
but I tried getting out of my head and just continued to listen to music and be on my phone in the car while I waited. Not really much more I could do. After I kind of calmed down from the initial anger I had, I started to check my surroundings. I didn't even notice at first because of everything going on, but in front of my car's placement was a field that was full of the most amount of deer I think I've ever seen at once. There legitimately must have been 40 deer in this field just walking around and eating the grass. The field wasn't directly in front of my car, but if I was to get out and throw a rock in that direction, I would have easily been able to hit one of them. So, if I was to guess, they were about 30 yards out. This didn't really help with the creepy level going on. Looking out in front of your car and seeing 80 eye reflections just staring back at you was a bit of an alarming feeling overall but I was relieved that it was just a field of deer. I watched them for a while, but I was quickly over it and started to just browse through my social media apps while waiting. They seemed to have been over it quicker than I was because they all went back to walking around and eating once they figured out that I wasn't going to attack them or anything. After browsing my phone for about 15 minutes, I finally get a call back from my parents letting me know that a tow truck guy is on the way and about an hour and a half out from my location. Still to this day, I remember hearing that and having the thought, you've got to be kidding me. I understood that me and only me was the reason that I was in my situation, so I couldn't really be mad at anyone else. But that was very obviously not what I wanted to hear. I decided that the smartest thing for me to do was just make sure that all my doors were locked, lay in my back seat, and take a nap to pass time quickly. So that's what I did. Okay, here we go. So I wake up 45 minutes later to the feeling of being watched. I'm not sure if anyone has ever experienced that feeling before because I don't know how common it is. But there was a sixth sense alarm going off in my head telling me that I need to wake up. Waking up to that feeling in that situation that I was in and the surrounding that I was in is probably the worst case scenario. I set up and immediately check my surroundings and see nothing. I looked through my car very quickly for any sort of weapon and found a pocket knife. An effing pocket knife. I was very scared. Even though I saw and heard absolutely nothing, that feeling is terrifying. I was shocked to see that the field of deer in front of me was still full of deer. I don't know anything about the animal, but I guess I always just assume that they don't hang out in the same place for long. Not sure why I thought that, but I was surprised to see them nonetheless. I called my parents back to see if they heard any kind of update from the tow truck dude. I decided not to mention the feeling that I was having because I didn't want them to worry more, and I also knew that it was literally nothing more than a feeling that I had, and I had nothing to back up why I was feeling that way other than just being spooked out in general. No update from the tow truck guy, so we all assumed everything was still the same on his end. The call lasted just a few minutes, because I felt like such a jerk. They both had to wake up for work in a few hours, now have to spend a random hundred dollars, and on top of that, they're worried about me. I could tell they were annoyed at the situation, but worried. I told them I'll make sure to tell them when the guy arrives, and I'm sorry. We hung up, and I looked up from the phone and immediately went from zero to a hundred in panic mode. The deer in front of me were all completely perked up, staring in the same direction right of them. Let me remind you that there are around 40 deer in this field. Every single one of them were stopped dead in their tracks, standing completely still, looking at something. I put my high beams on and stared, waiting for absolutely anything to happen at all. Nothing. I tapped on my horn real quick. They didn't even budge or look my way. They were all still completely glued to what was by them. The way the tree line was, I couldn't see that far over in the field. I know they were looking into the woods by them, but where I was at, I was only able to see them. I could hear my heartbeat. I grabbed that stupid pocket knife and just waited for something to happen. I would say it was about a minute after I honked, every single one of them in unison started to run the opposite way. They were running at full speed, and within 20 seconds the field was completely empty. I was petrified in fear. I knew that staying in my car is what would be the safest thing to do. 
but it's the worst feeling in the world when you feel like a sitting duck. My head was on a swivel. I was freaking out in every way possible. I assumed that it was a bear or something, but it could have been absolutely anything. I was convinced at that point it was the devil himself. I didn't know what to do. I knew that the tow truck was close by, but I had no idea where it was. I began to shake because of nerves and just looked around to make sure that nothing was by me and focusing on the field in front of me. I did this for what felt like an actual eternity, sitting in complete silence and darkness in the middle of nowhere, waiting for something to jump out and attack me. Fifteen of the longest minutes of my life go by, and I start to see lights break through the tree line on the road. As it gets closer, I see tow truck guy. The lights on his truck felt like it was Jesus coming from heaven to rescue me. He gets up to me and I jump out of my car and immediately ask him if he has a gun on him. I told him very quickly what just happened to me and that something is definitely out here nearby. He let me know that he had a shotgun in his truck and assured me that it was most likely a bear or a bobcat. He gave me the whole, they're more scared of you than you are of them BS. The tree was small enough for him to sort of bulldoze it out of the way with his truck. And then he attached my car to his and pulled me out of the spot that I was stuck in. He was very nonchalant about what I just experienced, but I was pretty badly shaken up from it. The whole time he was doing his thing, I still had my eyes glued out in that field waiting for something. He was completely done with everything in about 15 minutes, and he told me to follow his truck out of there onto the main road again. I got into my car and was ready more than anything to get the hell out of this park. We started to drive away from the spot that I was in, and I still had my head on a swivel, completely shook up. As we were driving away, I looked in my rearview mirror. We were down the park road just a tiny bit, but I could still see the spot that I was stuck in partially lit up from the vehicle lights and the moon. I watched in my rear view mirror a man come out of the tree line behind where my car was and walk into the middle of the road and watch us drive away. My heart stopped beating. Legitimately. I lost my breath and my eyes started to get full of tears because of how absolutely scared I was in this moment. I couldn't see any sort of details like what he looked like or even necessarily what he was wearing. To be honest, I don't really care. The feeling that I felt driving away from that spot knowing he was right there the whole time watching me. Watching me as I freaked out looking around. Watching me as I was completely alone for a long time. Maybe even coming right up to my window and watching me as I slept. That's a feeling that is something I can't necessarily put into words. All these years later, and it still messes with me quite a bit. The entire time we were driving off, as long as I could see him, he didn't move. Just watched us in the road. A million things went through my mind. I was scared there may have been multiple people up the road waiting for us. I was trying to figure out if I should start beating on my horn like crazy to get the tow truck guy to stop or not. I decided that all I wanted to do was to get out of there, more than anything. The second that we finally got out of the park and was able to be on a two-lane road again, I flew past the tow truck driver and did nothing below 70 miles per hour the entire way home. I flew through stop signs and stop lights. I absolutely did not care. The only thing on my mind was making it home. I got home, ran inside very quickly, acknowledged my parents and said sorry and thank you and went to my room. I didn't get a single second of sleep the rest of the night. I was searching for any sort of records of things happening in that area. Escaped convicts, similar stories, etc. I came to the conclusion that the man was some sort of squatter or homeless. I read many things online how it's common for homeless in rural areas to build shelter in the woods, which does make sense to me entirely on why they would do that. But obviously, the unknown is the scariest part of all. What if he wasn't homeless? What if he was going to hurt me? What if? What if? What if? There's so many possibilities of what could have happened. But the outcome that did happen is what I am most grateful for. I never told my parents this story until many years after it happened. And I was already an adult and moved out. It freaked them out too when I told them. I never went back to that park, ever. Even though I no longer live by there, I still have no desire at all to go back there. 
I don't think I could even in broad daylight with a ton of people around. I also made the decision to stop doing those late night cruises. I did a few after that time with people. But even then, I felt very uncomfortable and on edge. When I was 19, I used to love going for early morning runs alone in the woods outside my college campus. I never saw other runners on my trail and really enjoyed the silence in the early morning. However, one day, I was feeling unwell and decided to stop about halfway in. I was still relatively close to the outskirts of the woods when I keeled over and got sick. I heard crunching and turned to see a guy coming right towards me through the trees, seemingly out of nowhere. He was dressed in jeans and a hoodie, definitely not out for an early morning jog like me. I can't describe the instant unease that I felt as he silently quickened his pace towards me. I pulled myself together and ran out of there as fast as I possibly could. I ran my first and only six minute mile that day and never went for a run in those woods again. About 15 years ago, I lived in Sulphur, Oklahoma, my playground, the Chickasaw National Recreation Area. I love that park so much. I rode more miles on my bike than anywhere else. I've walked nearly every trail and rode every road. Every day I would ride my mountain bike up and down the trails and would be home by nightfall most days. One night, however, I had rode out a bit further than usual. On my way back, however, I decided to ride the trail from an area known as Buffalo Springs, where they have wild buffalo roam, and there is a large spring slash fountain there for all to enjoy. As I was riding back, I knew the end of the trail was coming up and I would have to cross a stone bridge across the creek, then up the road to my home. It was dark at this time and all I had to use to see was the full moon. I was maybe a few hundred yards from it when I got a sharp pain in my left thigh. I stopped and looked around to see what just hit me. Then I heard a noise sounded like something hit the ground hard in front of me. There was a rock about the size of a baseball rolling across the trail. Me, confused, starts to look up the side of this hill. Just as I turn my head to look, I almost fall off my bike when another rock comes flying down and hitting my front wheel. I finally have my eyes adjust to look and see someone very tall and covered in hair at the top of the hill throwing things at me and screaming. I yelled I had a cell phone and was going to call the police. I didn't actually have one as I didn't have a cell phone yet. This seemed to have pissed him off. He started charging down the hill at me. I, for obvious reasons, light up my bike and took off. Just as I crossed the bridge, I heard a huge splashing noise in the creek, and I saw that it was a large rock that had been thrown. I was in the clear to home, but was frightened all the way there. I went to the ranger station later the next morning and told a ranger I knew about what happened. He says, So you were attacked by Bigfoot? Snidely laughing. Me. I don't know what it was, but something was trying to hurt me out there. Park ranger. Okay, Justin. If I have any more Bigfoot, I'll let you know what we get. I just said fine and left. The very next week I was riding in the daylight when the park ranger pulled up next to me and said for me to get in. I asked why. He said he needed to show me something. We headed to the police department in town. Before we got out of the car, he turns to me and says, Justin, I have to give you a huge apology. I will be honest that I didn't believe you when you told me the story of you being attacked. However, It's come to my attention that a couple was out in the same area last night and was attacked in the same way, saying they had seen a large hairy creature throwing rocks and sticks and screaming at them. 
they called the police and they came out with some of the other rangers, including myself. I immediately thought about what you had told me. When we arrived and started up the hill, sure enough, we were having rocks and things thrown at us. Guns drawn and yelling, two officers tackled a man to the ground. He was six foot five, naked, covered in mud and had long hair and a large beard. He had escaped from the Veterans Center across Veterans Lake. Apparently, he thought he was back in Vietnam and he was trying to take out the enemy. Park Ranger said I was very lucky because he was trying to kill me. He went inside so I could give the police my statement as to what happened. They had him sent to a more secure facility somewhere else. To this day, I still get the shivers when I hike that trail. And I always keep my eyes on the top ridge. This happened a few years ago with my friend June when we were maybe 17 or 18. I'm 23 now. We were out driving around late at night on country back roads. We were teenagers growing up in a rural area, so going for a drive was one of the main ways that we passed the time. We were both into goth stuff and witchcraft at the time, so we pulled off the side of the road to walk around a small graveyard in the woods. It was impossible to see at night but we'd gone there a few times in the day before just to hang out. The whole area is heavily forested, but the path to the graveyard is short. It's right next to the road, just barely hidden in the woods. Anyway, we started slowly on the small loop that takes you around all the gravestones, using our flashlights to read the names and look at the carvings of the stones. I was very comforted by the gravestones at the night that time, so I was honestly very relaxed and we mused about ghosts and death and whatnot, as goth teenagers do. About halfway around the loop, at the furthest point from our car, June got my attention as she'd noticed a light in the woods. It looked far away, like it could have been a car on the road, so we turned away and kept walking. However, about 30 seconds later she got my attention again, and the light was much closer, and obviously quickly moving towards us and then I heard the sound of someone crashing through the woods. It was obviously someone with a flashlight making a beeline towards us, and we backtracked and ran to the car. I locked it and climbed into the driver's seat, turning the car on as fast as I could. And right before the lights came on, this huge grizzly looking man dressed head to toe in camouflage, carrying a huge crossbow and wearing a headlamp busted out of the foliage and was coming right for the car. He has this manic look in his eyes that just made me want to escape even more, and I reversed as quickly as I could and peeled out of there. We didn't stop driving for a while, even though we never saw him following us after we drove off. We both couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. Finally, I think we both got a bit too tired to stay out any longer and we went back to our houses. But I still constantly think about how quickly he got to us. If we hadn't sprinted right when we did, he would have caught us as we were getting into the car. I literally slammed my door about a second before he came barreling out of the woods towards us, plus the fact that there were no houses nearby. This person was waiting in the woods in full hunting gear with a weapon, and we clearly weren't animals, as we had a flashlight. And there isn't a no trespassing sign in sight. The whole area around this graveyard is state park. I go out into the woods and into weird places in the night a lot, and I've seen some stuff I would consider supernatural that really scared me. But none of those things ever truly made me feel afraid to go in the woods like he did. I still go out on my own, but I really never let my guard down like I used to. There's a hiking trail close to the school that I go to. It's about two miles to the top with a beautiful view over the entire valley. My friends and I went up one Saturday. 
The sun was beginning to set right as we started the two-mile walk down. Terrible timing, but we know the trail. Everything is good. Creepy, though, because it's getting dark and I'm paranoid to begin with. I'm not really paying attention, but I hear my friends say, What's that? I don't have good eyesight, so I looked, but didn't see anything. It's a girl, my guy friend said. I was freaked. It's nine o'clock on a hiking trail that not a single other person is on. As we get closer, I see that she's sitting on the ground in a pile of leaves with her knees to her chest. She's rocking back and forth in only a pink nightgown. It's February, so it's cold. My friends and I chalk it up to someone being on a terrible trip in the woods, feeling bad since that happened to my friend once, and we debated asking if she needed help. That was until my friend saw that she was cradling a knife in her lap. F that, I thought, I'm out of here. More freaked out, we picked up our pace, but still think the girl could just be tripping. We start joking, saying it must be a terrible trip in the woods at night to try and calm ourselves down. Then we see a man running frantically up the trail asking if we've seen his daughter. This girl was about 20. Not a little girl, although she was dressed like one. We say no, we haven't seen her, because we were freaked the F out, thinking we just saw a girl who escaped a kidnapper. As you can guess, we ran the rest of the way. Unfortunately, where we parked, there wasn't a single other car to call and give a license plate number. But we did call and report what we saw. They searched, but we never heard an update. Edit. There was no cell service until we got to our car. We saw the girl when we were about a mile from our car and it was almost pitch black. We had no way of being able to continue to watch her because it was too dark. We were also a group of two small female and one male with nothing for self-defense unless we were able to find something. It was a very scary situation. I was frozen in fear and we had no way of knowing if someone was using a female to lure us in. I terribly regret not saying something but we did as much as we could while keeping ourselves safe. When I was a little girl, I lived in an apartment complex with my mother. The entire complex consisted of two buildings that sat side by side, less than a hundred feet apart, with four two-bedroom flats, two upstairs and two down. We lived about a hundred yards down the hill from a major five-lane road, but you never would have known due to the thick woods that bordered the complex on three sides. The last side was an area cut for power lines that ran next to our driveway with a graveyard directly beyond it. It should go without saying that this setup was a recipe for many childish shenanigans as well as creepy encounters. On the front side of the complex and along the power line side were thick blackberry brambles. They weren't quite as thick as the long power line area, but in the front of the apartment you could stick your arm in without being torn apart by the thorns, and it was so thick it was nearly impossible to push through. This is relevant later. I was the only young child that moved there full time, and all the neighbors were, to the best of my knowledge, fond of me. I was active in Girl Scouts, so when it was time, I would go around to all the neighbors for orders. When cookies came in, I'd get my little wagon and deliver them to the neighbors by myself because my mother knew and trusted them. The day this happened, I had taken my wagon to the other building to deliver cookies. I hadn't meant to stay as long as I had but my mother's friend's husband had bought some new fish. I was fascinated with their aquarium, so I had spent about 45 minutes helping them pick out names. When I began to walk back, dusk had fallen. I had walked about seven steps off their porch when I got a bad feeling. Now that I'm older, I understand that I'm an empath and have learned to listen to my intuition. But back then, I just thought that I had to poo really bad. I stopped for a second to settle my stomach and heard a noise. When I looked to the front of the apartments where the blackberries were the most thick, initially I couldn't see anything. I forget exactly what alerted me to his presence, but I think he flicked a lighter or something. 
It was like he was trying to purposely alert me to his presence. The second I saw him, I froze. He had shoulder-length stringy black hair, bad skin, and looked like a skeleton he was so skinny. Knowing what I now know, I imagine he was probably strung out. I realized when he knew I saw him, because his face split in a wicked, not at all friendly grin. Then he began tearing his way through the blackberry brambles towards me. I began running towards my house while screaming bloody murder. Even over my screams, I heard his feet slap the pavement behind me. I got to my steps and my uncle Mike, who lived next door, flung his door open to see what the hell was going on. I began screaming and crying about the man that had chased me out of the woods, but the man had disappeared. Mike hadn't seen him, so I initially thought that it was just my imagination. But when they looked at that area that I said he'd emerged from, there was a clear area of broken brush and blood from where he had been cut by the thorns. After they took their machete to cut away the brambles and investigated where he'd come from, they discovered an area that he'd been standing in with a small pile of cigarette butts, like he'd stood there waiting for me when he saw me walk by across initially. A few weeks later, deeper into the woods, my mother's boyfriend and I discovered a small tent with assorted paraphernalia and very disturbing pornography. No one mentioned the connection, but I was very mature for my age, so when I thought about it, it disturbed me very much. So, disturbing stranger that departed your tent to watch me from the woods, let's not meet again. Last summer, I was camping with my partner and our 30-pound dog along a creek in a popular area in a nearby national forest. It was an established site, but not a campground. Parking spot, fire ring, nice flat area with access to the creek. Dead of night, we are awoken by a large truck parked in our car, just idling. Eventually, three men get out. They enter our camp. They're talking quietly. The truck and creek makes us unable to hear what they're saying. I'm pretty sure it's not good. Meanwhile, our dog has been growling lowly the whole time. Early on, I whispered to my partner to be quiet, hold the dog, and hide. I got out of our sleeping bag and put my shoes on. The only thing that I had for defense was a forest axe, halfway between a hatchet and an axe. Very useful for getting by in the woods. It had a leather sheath with a metal button latched to protect the blade. They took their time, perhaps as intimidation, but eventually got closer to our tent. I loudly plopped the metal button from the latch, taking the sheath off, preparing to become an axe murderer or be murdered myself, apparently. All three heard the latch. My assumption is they thought that it was a gun holster. Quickly left the camp, got in their truck, and left without another word spoken. Thank you all so much for watching to the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed all the stories. Also, a big special shout out to all of our channel members. Thank you so much to Inner Scare Wifey Simp, Lot, Vanita Tillman, Sarah Rodriguez, Shane Wilson, Sarah Wood, Jacob Ryumi, Claire, Sherry Uchel, Zane Loggins, Martha APS, Hail Mary, Gingerbread, Carrie Morris, Crystal, Brown Doe, Jado, Inner Scare Wifey, Chili MC, Snowing Wine Drops, Tina Mead, Taylor Ruist, Casey Brown, Caroline Hawksworth, Eric Donter, the Grim Reaper's Nightmare, Simply Complicated, Tangela Young, Miss Cannabis, Anon Q, 
Mathematica, Christy Goodall, Skin Crawler, Taryn, Ruby Wilson, Jennifer Moyer, Classic Sonic the Hedgehog, Cappy Karma, Paul Reese, Via Mash K0101 and Honey Pond. Thank you all so much for being members. And thank you everybody for watching. Please make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe. And please enjoy the extra rain at the end of this video. Good night, everybody.